so to begin with, I would like to invite you, Raphael, to set the scene a little bit by, um, by talking a little bit about the book and saying what motivated you to write it. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, the motivation to write a book came totally accidentally. I was looking for some trial records against the French colonial prisoners of war. And then I found um, 55 volumes with trial records against French prisoners in general. But they were almost all, all dealing with women love relations. And uh, so it was this archival find that prompted me um, to get into this topic. Um, the book is based on research in 22 archives in eight different countries. And I have examined approximately 2,000 tribunals against prisoners of war and 250 court um, cases against um, German women. The files for the women are much more extensive than the files for the POW. There are love letters in there, there are interrogation records, there are denunciation letters, there are all sorts of materials in there that provide a very rich, rich texture to the relationship and to the um, context. Um, the book is structured essentially by following the experience of um, the prisoners and the women. So it starts with basic questions. Where and when did they meet? How did they communicate? What kinds of love relations or relations in general did they develop? How were these relations discovered? Which then throws light on the community reactions of them. Um, how did the uh, trials proceed against prisoners and women to different um, uh, court systems um, with similar ideas, but um, different um, procedures? What happened after they were incarcerated? Um, I followed the prisoners to military prisons and the women to often to penitentiaries, um, very harsh um, uh, German uh, jails. And I deal a little bit with the um, memory or rather the lack of memory of these um, uh, relationships. And I present a couple of case studies at the end because I'm using a lot of um, uh, illustrations and examples from the stories in the thematic chapters of the book, but I wanted the reader also to be able to follow the story from the beginning to the end. And in the conclusion, I just basically reflect on what does this all mean? Is this an act of resistance? Under which conditions does the qualify of resistance or what to what sense to make of these relationships. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you, Raphael. So um, lots of different themes to, to talk about there. But I think if, if we could um, begin just by thinking about, I think one of the, the biggest surprises for readers of the book might be perhaps in your depiction of prisons of war. Um, and if you could maybe start by saying a little bit about um, how that the you know the the experience of prisoners of war may be slightly different from from our preconceptions and and how they in fact interacted with um, German civilians. Yeah, the literature on the prisoners of war is dominated by what I call the prison camp paradigm, and that's often also the popular view that mm. prisoners of war in Nazi Germany were enclosed by barbed wire, that they were in an all male environment where the only non comrades they met were guards, usually mean guards and commanders. That image is true for officers and for elite prisoners. And it's very much derived from these um, elite prisoners who were also the most vocal about sharing their experience. And they were really in uh, camps behind barbed wire in all male environment. But the rank and file soldiers, they were not at all. They were constrained to work, and that was legal according to the Geneva Convention. The officers did not have to work. Some of the elite prisoners, intellectuals, got clerical work in the camps, but the rank and file soldiers, the vast majority, had to work. And that there's no way that they could not get into contact with German civilians because they were working in farms and factories, shoulder to shoulder with the German labor force. And also with a non-German labor force, and it's something that still could be explored more, those relations with POWs and non-German laborers, forced and volunteers. But the German labor force consists increasingly of women. Um, it's predominantly women in the factories, more and more women who are taking over, working on the farms. So these prisoners have been in contact um, with um, German civilians guarding is often relatively light 
um, some prisoners already early on, the French and the Belgians, for example, are dropped off on a farm and they're left there. And guarding consists of an elderly German reserve soldier who comes on a bicycle every three weeks with a list and checks if the prisoner is still there and asks if the prisoner has any complaints or if the employers have any complaints and then disappears. Um, some prisoners are kept in abandoned schools or restaurants and there's a guard with them who sleeps with them and who locks the door at night. There's always a loose window, there's always a rusty bar, there's a pick lock that the prisoners can't produce. So they can get out, but they do get out of night and they do get back in undetected in the morning. And the prison, the guard needs sleep too, and often he makes sure he does sleep and he closes both eyes. So these prisoners have much, much more contact with German civilians than that prison camp paradigm suggests. Yeah, it's fascinating and, and completely unexpected, I think. Um, I was also sort of interested, I wondered if you could speak a little bit um, to to whether that, um, whether the relationships, whether how, you know, how much PO, uh, POWs of different nationalities were treated differently and whether there were variations, you, you um, hinted at the fact that perhaps there were in your variations in the treatment of um, POWs from different countries. The French and Belgian prisoners were treated somewhat differently because their countries were occupied by Nazi Germany. The French had a collaborating government, the Belgians largely collaborating administration. So and that was very different from the situation of British prisoners. The Britons still were later on the Americans as well. Um, the part of the British prisoners tend to be stricter for the whole period. Although even there, there were uh, great accusations in the regime by 1943. The personnel shortage in the German army was just so drastic that um, they could, could not guard even these um, uh, prisoners from the country that was actually at war with Nazi Germany. They couldn't guard them very carefully. Um, I also discovered that the um, British prisoners, uh, even though we only find trial beginning in late 1942 and early 1943, um, even with good guarding, there were commanders who just didn't get it and who tolerated the relations of um, British prisoners with German women, who did not finish the court martial, basically predatory tribunal against these prisoners, but punished them maybe with a disciplinary punishment that left no records, because commanders could just do this, put their prisoner into arrest for a week or two, and that would be over. That leaves no archival trace, really. And um, uh, then in late 1942, the Nazi um, authority found these circulars asking the commanders um, to treat the British um, or German civilians the same way. The men need to come in front of a military tribunal. And then these cases begin appearing as well in British. Um, and what about Eastern European countries? Is that. that is very different um, because um, Nazi Germany did not recognize the Geneva Convention in a relationship to the um, Soviet Polish POW. Initially, with the Polish POWs, um, they argued that Poland had ceased to exist as a state and therefore um, refused to treat the Polish prisoners according to the uh, Geneva Convention. And then there are also um, big laws in Nazi Germany um, that a love relationship with the Pole, regardless of the status of that Polish man, um, leads only to execution of the Pole, be he a laborer or a POW, it does not matter. And the women with Poles um, would be deported to a concentration camp, usually without. There are some trials involved with Polish POWs. I have not find, found any explanation why some women were put on trial and the majority were just taken away to a concentration camp. The same applies to relations with Soviet um, soldiers, where women also had a trial. So there the treatment is radically um, different. There's no international oversight. There is international oversight with the um, Western prisoners, of course, of the 7th and 3rd legal regime. 
And I guess that leads on to what is unsurprisingly another really important theme in the book, which is the, the sort of Nazi conceptions of race. Um, and I wondered if you could say a little bit about that as well and, and how that evolved, if that if that evolved over the course of the war. Yeah, that was one of my big surprises. The Nazi regime initially says this prohibition has to do with many different things, libertad, espionage, escapes, but it is about race. Um, we want to prevent racial that's what they say. And then later, I find documentation that um, uh, uh, German authorities suddenly say this prohibition is not at all about rape. It is about domestic cohesion, about having a very strong wartime community that is united in hatred of the foreigner, in hatred of the enemy, regardless whether it's a defeated enemy like the French or the Belgians or a still active enemy like the British. American. So this total turnaround um, intrigued me and attracted me to find out why. Part of the reason is that the prisoners are such a mixed race, racial group. There are many prisoners who, according to Nazi categories, are racially desirable, or at least completely unobjectionable. Mm -hmm. They are South African, Australian prisoners of German descent. They're totally unobjectionable. The Belgians, the Dutch-speaking Belgians in particular, sort of makes no sense. And then what is worse for the Nazi authorities is that they can't even really define German very well. They initially think that German means women of German blood. But then the French government, the Vichy government protests and said, no, 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 you can't do that. In international legal documents, if you speak German, it needs to mean nationality. They are particularly angry because there are some French prisoners who are um, Alsatian women and uh, because they are considered ethnically German, these prisoners are punished. And the German authorities back down and said, yes, you're right, we can't punish these prisoners for them and they cancel the punishments for the prisoners. But there are women who are sterilized by the Nazi regime. And these women say there is no way that my relationship with the prisoner could have led to the pollution of the German race. The prisoner uses the same argument. And then there are these areas, particularly where the British prisoners are held, um, German Polish border regions, where many local people don't know clearly am I Polish? Am I German? They speak both. They may have opted for Germany in 1918 or, or Poland, but still that doesn't cancel the other nationality. So there are ambiguities there and the whole concept of this becomes totally unmanageable. And the Nazi authorities recognize this. It's fascinating to see how they themselves realize that race is such a central concept, but we can't nail it down. We can't um, figure it out. So let's abandon it in this case. And what you're saying there about um, sort of the experience of gender and community is also absolutely fascinating. I wonder if you can say a bit more about the experience of women and how, you know, how they behaved, whether they, um, you know, whether the war made them behave differently and, and what you what your research revealed about, um, you know, sort of gender and community, I guess, in, in this context. With respect to the women, I, I do see the uh, women under enormous stresses. They are loaded with responsibilities that they normally don't have to address, at least not alone. Um, farm women have to make a lot of decisions in the absence of a husband, for example, and uh, they're under extreme stress. Urban women um, that their children working long hours, but also their own Sometimes they lose their partner because of the bombing, they move in with a sister, and they end up not and the population structure is very peculiar. There are basically, if, if these women are unmarried and they want to have a relationship with a man, there are almost no German men in their age group around. The only men who are around are foreigners. And the uh, Eastern laborers um, are so stigmatized that it's very, very dangerous, of course, to engage with them. The prisoners are kind of the lower risk. Of and for the married women as well, um, their husbands often from the army of home, often after a year of um, He's usually a traumatized and deeply troubled um, man 
And these um, home leaves do not often go well. So very often after the husband leaves, um, the prisoner them. And he's kind and he's sensitive and then so um, the relations often start in, in that uh, context. The communities are very interesting because yes, there are a lot of financiation. But the more interesting question that I found is that often not why do people denounce, but why do people not denounce? Because there obviously was a lot of knowledge of these relations. The uh, 2000 cases I looked at are only the tip of the iceberg. There are many, many more. And there are many, many more that never come to trial. And there is a, and there is a residue of communal solidarity. Um, sometimes um, quite um, widely politically motivated, um, where uh, particularly women are objecting to the duplicity of the policy that um, a German man can have relationships with French women, with Belgian women, with impunity. You want British women on the Chinese islands, um, this is quite widespread there too. Um, it's a little bit different in Eastern Europe, but um, the, the German man can generally get away with the relation with a foreign woman. Um, why are women so severely? That just doesn't make sense. So um, the communities often react in, in very nuanced ways. Many employers, both in factories and in farms, try to warn the couple. They try to make the prisoner um, go away. And transferred in order to break up the relationship. Guards do the same thing. They often tolerate a relationship for quite a long time until it becomes too dangerous for them because there is a cost involved there. If they toler obviously tolerate the relationship for too long, they are liable to be punished on themselves. And um, uh, often the couples don't listen to the one and they keep, keep um, meeting. And then that's where when a demonstration happens. And what about what about prostitutes? How did they fit into these patterns of illicit and um, illicit relationships and um, patterns of female behaviour and what was prohibited? Um, there are very few prostitutes that I found in, in the cases that I analysed, although there were some interesting cases where the guards would actually allow the prison to go to a, a local um, brothel, and they would stand outside and wait until the prisoner came out again. And the prisoner in his defense would then point that out, so why do you punish me? The guard was there, and um, that was uh, very ambiguous. There were some Nazi lawyers who said, well, German women who are engaging with um, prisoners of war are prostitutes anyway. And there are actually some defense attorneys who took advantage of that because um, a lot of the, the prohibitions for the women were framed in national honor. And um, these defense attorneys said, well, you can punish the soldier on the basis of violating German national honor if he had contact with a prostitute, because the prostitute is not, that doesn't have any national honor. It's a very misogynistic argument, but um, some defense attorneys can try this, not, not with much success. Generally. Fascinating. Um, and I guess maybe sort of somewhat relatedly to that, you talked about the, the, the sort of the theme of resistance and whether these illicit relationships constituted an act of resistance, which is obviously um, a hugely controversial topic. But I wondered what conclusions, if any, you were able to draw about that and what your yeah. thoughts were. The definition of resistance um, has broadened considerably over the last few decades. Um, it's no longer just um, somebody picking up an arm and uh, fighting the regime um, in, in violent ways. Um, the vast majority of Europeans and the occupied Europe did not have such opportunities. Um, and I have to answer the question somewhat differently for the prisoners of war, because prisoners are to some extent expected to be resistant. They are members of an hostile army, and um, at the very least, they are um, supposed to try to escape. So the Geneva Convention is very um, specific and taking escape as an honorable thing, as a national duty to do. And um, you cannot punish a prisoner except with a um, relatively mild disciplinary punishment if, uh, if we capture them and escape. And, the prisoners are also through their um, social norms, they're supposed to behave 
poorly. The, the British had German goon baiting. So the Germans as dummies, um, like one of the guards, there's an expectation that the prisoners behave basically like a, a bunch of um, uh, nasty schoolboys in the 1940s, try to pick their teachers and so that is the morality. That has nothing to do, however, with the way these prisoners of war approach German women. Many of them want to marry them. At least in the early years, many of them want to stay in Germany after the war and build a lasting relationship, keep working in that land, keep working in that factory and legalize that forbidden um, relationship. For the women, it is a different thing. And there, I think it does come down to an act of resistance. And um, so in the most basic way, it is a refusal to hate. It is a refusal to hate the prisoner as an enemy, as an irreconcilable evil enemy, to embrace the prisoner even as a foreign man, to bridge the communication difficulty. And um, that, I think, is a disruptive act. And the Nazi regime definitely treats it as such. They put the uh, women in the most severe cases in a kind of a special court. These were courts that were built up in order to deal with political opposition, with um, resistance. And um, the punishments were very hard um, against these um, women. But the Nazi regime did certainly do that in an act of uh, conscious resistance. Um. So and then just a, a little bit about the, so obviously the, the source base, as you touched on in your introductory remarks, is immensely rich, but also immensely personal. I just wondered if that um, brought up any particular issues um, in writing the book about privacy or anonymity um, and what, uh, you know, sort of what, what the particular challenges were. Yeah, well, since I work in eight different countries and privacy laws are somewhat different in each of them, I decided to essentially anonymize all the prisoners and the women by reinventing their last names. And I may have gone terribly wrong, I don't know, <laughs> I understand, but I um, invented last names for all of them in order to protect their privacy. Um, I did not see a legal restriction on um, anonymizing the denouncers, so I did not. Uh, where they are known, often letters came in anonymously. Um, it creates some awkward situations sometimes because I have some friends who I know had ancestors or relatives who were in German captivity and I have seen their trial records and I know that these friends very likely have a German family that they don't know about. But I can't say anything because of privacy reasons. Because I know that the woman involved with this ancestral relative was um, of the child from the prison of war, or that there was already a baby. Um, relations were discovered after years with already little family. How awkward. You must be, well, it must be very difficult to be discreet in that situation. Yes. Um, and another thing that you, you touched on earlier when we were talking about the, the sort of different experience of, of, of uh, both the women and the prisoners of war, but um, uh, I wondered if you could say a little bit more about how that changed or whether that changed over the uh, over the course of the war and whether um, the punishments or the attitudes um, softened or became stricter and how what, what you were able to find out about that. The punishments for the prisoners of war tend to get more severe. Um, the the popular perception of the prisoners tends to be uh, increasingly reconciling. The, uh, uh, many women do not understand anymore why they are punished for a relationship with a French or Belgian prisoner at a time when there are French and Belgian volunteers fighting over with They find that out in trials and defense at home, um, but that doesn't. Um, uh, any um, major um, impact. The prisoners are Hitler initially. He initially wanted all the Western prisoners to be attacked, like the police and the, later the Soviet prisoners. Um, the military and diplomatic authorities uh, basically said it was impossible to do against the Geneva Convention. 
but Hitler maintains a personal interest, and um, as he sees that there are that his bases are becoming more and more numerous, more exponentially in 1941, late 1941, 42, um, he increases uh, the punishments, especially for prisoners who are in the soldiers in their punishment. The, uh, uh, the women's punishment are extremely harsh in the very beginning, but the arrest and detention of a woman creates nothing less than catastrophe for her family and often for the community. And these women are as as they are taking care of elder relatives, they're taking care of children. It is a social disaster and it affects the community because um, it takes out a, a valuable worker, and um, the consequences of the detention, the incarceration of these women are really dramatic. So the authorities are flooded with clemency, um, and they do react by letting women go home, for example, to give birth to a baby, um, to work in the harvest, or to work during particularly stressful times. They always say, but doesn't mean that it's anything going to be will have to serve longer in the country. But there is some um, if they are, I suspect, I cannot really find it in a certain document, but I suspect it has a lot to do with the fact that the um, incarceration of the women is so socially disrupted in Nazi wartime. Fascinating, thank you. Um, and I guess another um, another thing I was interested in Pat, was, or in asking you to, to say a little bit more about is how this um, how this book intersects with your um, with your other research, for example, in in North Africa. Whether there are you know what were the biggest surprises for you, um, or the points of continuity in the in the behaviour of the guards, I guess, um, or in another. Yeah. I had already found that the German guards in charge of um, French colonial prisoners, I mean, most of them were held in Nazi occupied France. That's why I don't have many, I have, have a few, but not many um, relations between French colonial prisoners and German women inside um, Germany. I do have some uh, Indians, um, British Indians, um, and uh, um, people from you know, other parts of the British um, the colonial empire. But um, I already saw that many of these guards were very pragmatic. They were often older, not that Nazified. They were called um, good old papas by um, the prisoners. And um, they developed fairly pragmatic and friendly relations with the small groups of prisoners that they supervised. And I see that um, happening in Germany to some extent um, as well. Um, one of the big surprises was also um, the Nazi uh, um, implementation of laws, because um, there were quite a few Jewish prisoners in the French army and in the British army. There were Polish prisoners, people with Polish nationality, serving with uniform and British uniform. And if they hadn't had the status of POWs, they um, would have been executed in Nazi Germany. As POWs, they were treated like a non-Jewish um, POW. Same is true for uh, Indians, um, British Indians on, on trial, people from Cyprus or, or other places of the um, British Dominion. There were even some, I found the most um, stunning case of a, a Jew from Warsaw who had emigrated to Palestine before the war and enlisted in the British Army as a volunteer who was on trial. And um, everybody knew he was a Jew, but um, he was tried um, barely 30 miles from Auschwitz in 1943-44, um, and he got a fairly moderate um, sentence in military prison. So, and the women too, which I found even more surprising, um, when it was clear that they had known this prisoner is Jewish. And they could have, could have been convicted much more harshly, but they were also committed like, or they were sentenced like a woman who had had a relationship with a non-Jewish Western um, prisoner. So there's the international law there that colors these um, crimes to a surprising degree in Nazi Germany in that time. Thank you. Um, 
Well, that's fascinating. We've had, so relatedly, I guess you, you touched on that, but I did, so um, a question from the audience um, regarding the situation of black POWs, French or Belgian, um, and asking about German women's reaction to, um, to those, uh, to, to black POWs specifically. Um, I think you suggested that there were a few examples, but I don't know if there's anything more you can say there. Um, the, the black prisoners were only shortly brought to Germany in 1940, and then they were very quickly um, brought back to Japan. So um, they had practically no opportunity to engage with German women. Um, there are about um, 13,500 who come back to Germany in 1944 but then in very chaotic um, circumstances. Um, there were some North African um, prisoners um, in Germany because the, um, again, the Nazi racial categories, it was basically a visual test of the camp commander that determined whether this prisoner was of non-European descent or not, and it's so totally arbitrary. I have identical twins where one commander said, oh, look, an Arab, go to France, and another says, ah, looks French, can stay in Germany. So, um, and, and with the Indians as well, there, there were um, these relations as well, but there were, uh, to my knowledge, no relations that, that involved black or French prisoners. There were many relations in occupied France. Um, that's a subject of, of an other book in the French colonial prisoners. And um, those raised interesting issues for the French authorities, particularly the liberation. Interesting. Um, another question from the audience: uh, Who was involved in the persecution of Verbotena Umgang of sorry of POWs and German women? Uh, so was it the Gestapo or the Wehrmacht? Is the question? It was different for the prisoners. It was the army authorities, so the Wehrmacht um, military justice system. Um, they were responsible for the tribunals um, against the prisoners of war. For the women, it was um, in the in most cases, it was a so-called special court. And these were the courts that I pointed out were designed to fight political dissent, political um, opposition. Um, they were supposed to be very fast and very strict. Um, the chief of the system called them the uh, Panzer or of German justice, who quick and ruthless, basically. Um, they, <laughs> found it very difficult, however, because um, uh, very often the gathering of evidence was, was very tricky um, and took time, and they were more conscientious, actually, than they uh, wanted to be. The Gestapo played a role in um, sometimes in interrogating um, the women, although the first interrogation in the countryside often happened from the local policemen, who often knew the woman and her family, and that was very different. But in the city, it was usually um, the Gestapo who dealt with this. And because it was considered basically a, a case of national treason, these women were engaging with an enemy, and the legislation for them was part of the same legislation that um, uh, uh, applied to acts of um, uh, uh, treason in Germany. Fascinating. Um, oh, another question. Um, so to say, this is from uh, from Richard Carswell, who's named himself. Um, he says, uh, presumably relations relations range from simple sexual liaisons to great love affairs. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> yes, they're definitely some encounters that are more casual and um, uh, more directly um, uh, sexual, there's no question. But um, the, the relationships are often difficult to qualify because um, they change. And um, the um, more superficial or seemingly more superficial relations can um, suddenly reveal very different aspects um, when it comes to trial or when you look at the love letters in between them. Um, there's suddenly a much more dedicated and a sincere um, commitment, and vice versa. Some relations, I've always been sometimes disappointed in some <laughs> wonderful romantic relations, but when they come to court, they become nasty. They accuse each other, and, and they try everything to um, make it seem as if the, the woman seduced the man, the man seduced the woman, and um, try to deflect responsibility from themselves. So, and these, these relationships are very um, flexible. Of course, they are happening in a very stressful environment because you do have to worry about 
in discovery, even if many um, couples can live their relationship relatively unencumbered, uh, relatively freely for a long time until somebody pronounces them, it's still necessary. Yeah. Um, another question from the audience. So what, uh, what about relationships between POWs and forced laborers? There were relationships between POWs and forced laborers. Um, they deserve more exploration. The POWs essentially um, were not punished um, because their order, they have an order that is passed in January 1940, applies only to German um, women. So um, foreign women are okay. Um, there are a few camp commanders, especially in the Polish German border regions, who get upset about these racial ambiguity. And then they decide, okay, we'll stop with this. We'll just say all relations of POWs with women are punishable. And so they also punish prisoners for engaging with non German women. They usually get a lighter punishment, but they are also punished. But it's only in two. Uh, districts um, in, uh, in the region of Danzig in uh, Posen, it's not in, in all of the, the regions. Um, the civilian laborers get punished as well. Um, there are trial records against the civilian laborers, um, women and also men, sometimes men in homosexual relationships or sometimes men in um, simple relationships of solidarity, where they help the prisoner, for example, submitting letters. Um, they are also applied in the same uh, system in the very similar situation. Sorry, another question. Um, could the past political activities and affiliations of a woman who had had a relationship with a PAW influence her trial either positively or negatively? Um, and could that question extend even to the woman's husband if she had one? Thank you for the question. That is actually very, very important. Um, the courts, the special courts did basically a political uh, litmus test with all of um, the women and their families. And um, I have found um, that that is, had a great influence on the way they were sentenced. Um, I have two parallel cases in uh, Northern Germany one woman was the wife of a um, farmer. Both were members of the Nazi party. Another woman had once belonged to a uh, communist swimming club. And um, the punishment on the surface was very similar, but the implementation of the punishment was radically different. The Nazi woman um, very quickly uh, got dismissed from the penitentiary on the basis of in minor ailment, also she got pregnant during one of her breaks, and her husband this time, and um, uh, she basically spent very little time in the penitentiary. The woman with the socialist um, swimming club, um, she had to serve a sentence to the fullest. Um, the husband's affiliation played a major role. They looked very carefully. Um, there were some women who, under Gestapo, said quite openly, I would not die for Hitler. I do not like this system. And the punishment was very hard in these cases. I have an 18 year old woman um, had a beautiful love affair with a French um, POW, and um, she had written some notes to him that exemplified her position. He was punished very, very harshly, even though. 18 year olds would usually get much milder punishment on the basis of use that is totally disregarded. And that also then played against the family. When the families asked for these women maybe to be released before their sentence was served or to happen temporarily come home during stressful periods, there is absolutely no way that these women would have these requests granted if they had. Um, a left wing cast, or if they had anything of the material in their file. Um, another question Do you have much evidence of women actively hiding or aiding escape attempts by POWs? I gather this aspect was highlighted in German experience during the First World War and shaped attitudes in the Second. Yes, um, there are uh, quite a few cases um, of. Um, Prisoners deciding to escape 
simply because they want to be with a woman they love and then they are in their apartment and that's that's a situation where role reversals sometimes really comes into play they are at home all day they're taking care of the children and the woman is uh, working outside is the breadwinner who is the contact of the prisoner to the external world and he, well, he's supposedly uh, taking care of the children, taking care of the household, often doesn't do much on the household. He smokes all day and listens to records and reads trashy novels. But it's, uh, it's totally isolated and um, uh, uh, separated from the world and the woman and uh, all of that. Um, there were some relations where uh, these couples try to flee together, even involving the people. And sometimes, and um, I, I can't imagine how, I mean, even the British prison alone would have um, uh, imagined getting back to Britain. That was difficult enough. But then with a German woman um, on a side, uh, very, very difficult. Um, but they, they thought they could do it and they tried. And um, then they were uh, captured. There were quite a few couples who wanted to stay together after the war. And um, this became very painful because often the military police would pick the um, ex POWs from the farms um, and would force them to go home. And sometimes they would want to bring their German um, uh, uh, women friends with them. And the military authorities, there's absolutely no way um, some French prisoners smuggled the German women to France, but they then were interned. The women were interned of enemy aliens and not treated very nicely. The families, oh, come on, you can't bring home a Bosch a wife, a German wife, impossible. But what will the neighbors say? Um, you can do that. So um, the hurdle is very hard. Did you find any reason why the Nazi authorities didn't simply didn't simplify matters for themselves and relocate the Belgian and French POWs to their occupied home countries to work in armaments factories supporting the German war effort? Yes, um, they did, the Nazi authorities did consider this and they did to some extent um, release um, essential workers and already fairly early on that comes out of agreements of the Vichy uh, government with Nazi Germany, but um, the vast majority of the French prisoners stayed in uh, Germany. What the Nazi authorities then did was um, try to offer these prisoners a changed um, legal statute where they could basically become like civilians. And that was a very slippery slope because then these prisoners would uh, take off their uniforms, they would be civilians, they would be a civilian worker, and they would be completely unsupervised. And um, their cases were called transformed prisoners were um, to a local office with their beloved woman and they were applying for a marriage license and the uh, town clerk would turn around and tell the police that you know, the prisoner of war is still liable to work under these orders. So um, that did not um, work. There was some pressure to ease the punishment um, for relations with French and Belgian prisoners and that is where Hitler personally and the chief of uh, the chief of the German High Command, um, uh, Field Marshal Keitel, personally intervened and said, "Absolutely not. Um, we cannot treat these uh, prisoners more lightly um, for these relations." Fascinating. Sorry, I'm just seeing if there's another question coming in. Um, in the meantime, uh, a question from me. So you mentioned um, that the, the book has a chapter on case studies, um, and I wondered if we could ask you to say a little bit more about what your favourite case study was, or your the favourite individual story that you find either found either most surprising or, um, or most emblematic of the story that you were trying to, to tell. Yeah, I liked all the case studies very much. Um, that's why I, I highlighted them. <laughs> um, perhaps my favorite is um, of um, uh, four women in a little German town south of Frankfurt. Um, and they're working in, in, in a local um, a factory, a sugar factory, actually. And um, uh, many German women 
see French prisoners and French-speaking Belgian prisoners as having incredible acts of fear. And um, this one woman, um, her husband is just really mean to her. He's left and she doesn't even know where he is. He's serving in the German army. And this prisoner is such a sweet guy. And um, one day he offers him, why don't you escape? I'll hide you. She escapes. He escapes. Very easy. He climbs over the fence at night. Um, she waits outside and gives him a coat of her husband so he doesn't uh, show his uniform and he goes home. She has um, uh, uh, three women who are basically neighbors and who quickly realize, oh, there's something happening there. And um, they're very inquisitive and it's happening on very, very constrained rooms. So they, they hear things and they, they find out very quickly that this woman has a French prisoner. And then this smart one says, I want a Frenchman too. <laughs> um, the French prisoner, this nice guy there, um, he says, oh, oh, my comrade, yeah, I know, Marcel, I'll, I'll write to him. And uh, he, he can come too, and Marcel comes too. So there are two prisoners. Coming. It's a little dangerous because there is a army office just below and in the, in the floor below and they have to go in front of the door of that army office every time they come back to their apartment but they have a wonderful time they take civilian clothes they go out they take the train to frankfurt they go to a cabaret and, and, so, and then um uh, the, the third woman says hmm, I really like a french prison too. and um so it, it, it multiplies and it comes out in, it's not even totally clear how it comes out. The neighbors know about it, even um, the guards know about it. There's a lot of knowledge about it. And it seems that at some point it becomes embarrassing. The factory director knows about it and, and doesn't do anything about it. But um, they are now multiplying escape and then um, the factory director knows, okay, the authorities will come in and they will get after me for not um, ensuring security well enough. So um, that then leads um, to the arrest of uh, uh, these uh, couples. So they, I mean, some of the scenes are just dramatic, like in an Italian uh, Commedia dell'arte um, theater, because one woman's husband comes home just after Marcel arrives. So there's an agreement that Marcel climbs out the balcony gets into a window from the neighboring apartment and the other woman knows everything and she hides Marcel um, for a few days until the husband leaves again the husband um, uh, doesn't notice anything so maybe that's, that's my favorite <laughs> it's a brilliant story um so I can't see any more questions coming in please do send your questions if there's anything else you would like to ask Raphael I just have one further question myself which um, I wondered, so you talked a bit about how the, the inspiration for writing the story was the, um, for, for, came through an archival discovery, but um, I think that you also have a personal connection to the, to the story. And I wondered if, um, to, in, you know, in conclusion, you would be able to say a little bit about your, your grandfather and your, um, that, your, 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 your personal connection to the, to the themes of the book. Yeah. Um, I have, um, a, a interesting grandfather. I think. Well, I have two interesting grandfathers. One <laughs> very famous uh, flautist. He was professor at the, university, at the high school in Berlin, the music school. He's very famous. Um, if you look at any records from the 60s, you'll find him, Gustav Scheck. I have another grandfather who's from a totally different environment. He was from the poorest region of uh, pre-World War I Germany in East Russia, who is a gardener. Um, basically a friend who never uh, has the money to get a degree as a gardening master. And um, he's unemployed for many, many years. He joins the Nazi party in 1934 because he gets a job through the party to plant shrubbery on top of Air Force boundaries. It's still illegal at the time and, and hidden. So um, you need to be a party member. And this prisoner, uh, this, uh, sorry, uh, this uh, grandfather um, is not drafted into the German army because he only had one eye that was functional. He had been kicked by a horse in his pressure in his childhood, um, so he couldn't be a uh, frontline material. Um, but in 1942 or 43, he was uh, still drafted into the German army. 
and he was sent to a nobleman's estate west of Berlin, where there were 15 prisoners of war, and he was asked to buy them. Um, Russian uh, Soviet prisoners of war were the worst um, treated, absolutely, uh, there's no question. Um, he realized they were starving, and he also realized that there was a barn with peas, and um, so he um, found out somehow, I don't know how they communicated, but he found out that one of the prisoners um, was a cook, and he took that prisoner with him, filled his pan with peas, filled his own pans with peas, and then they opened the pans in the prisoner quarters and uh, took the meal. And once a prisoner got sick, and my grandfather thought, um, he needs um, my wife's chicken food. So he took this Russian prisoner onto the local suburban train and drove into Berlin to his apartment and sent my mother out to get milk from the corner store, which my mother probably did, and she even betrayed to the local um, shop lady. Um, my father has a Russian prisoner at home and he's really sick and we need milk for him. <laughs> the lady just, it was a pretty communist environment, so um, the lady didn't um, uh, betray her. And um, in 1945, the 15 Russian prisoners had become very fond of my grandfather. And when the Russian army approached, they warned him. They told him that um, he would be executed immediately if they uh, caught him. And um, they gathered all their secret um, possession in their charms. And they gave them to my grandfather and said, um, take this and try to escape, go to the West, which he did. He became a British prisoner for a short time. He escaped, he ran away because he simply wanted to know what had happened to his wife and daughter. They were still in Berlin, he didn't know whether they were alive, whether they were not in um, but he, he escaped there. But they, they basically stripped the Russian and saved his life. Although sadly, the 15 Russians are very likely to have been um, put into the gulag and he never came to the Soviet Union because Stalin deeply mistrusted um, all the people who have been prisoners of war in Germany. Um, some of them were executed as traitors that were Soviet army. So, um, my grandfather um, talked about them and wrote um, grateful to them. Uh, I dedicated prisoners to the field doing some yeah. work. Thank you for sharing that story, which really points to the complexities um, of, the, of the themes of the book. Um, one, I'm going to take one final question, um, I think, uh, which is, was there any prohibition on relations between German women and volunteer workers from Norway and Denmark? No, there wasn't. There wasn't any prohibition on um, volunteer and also forced laborers from Western and Northern um, Europe. This only applied to um, Eastern Europeans. So um, a German woman engaging with a friend civilian laborer was not punished. The SS authorities um, were curious about this discrepancy and there were various initiatives to also make these relationships, at least with the French um, workers and Belgian workers, punishable. But um, the Nazi authorities felt ultimately that that would go against their efforts of recruiting these laborers. They first wanted them as volunteers. When that didn't work, they um, forced them. So that never uh, came through. Um, Norwegian and uh, Danish uh, women, these relationships were actually highly valued. And um, there were special programs by the SS that's now um, quite well researched um, for these women um, who had a very hard take after the war because they were treated as outcasts, the same in the Netherlands as well and in, in Belgium. And um, their children were often um, also treated very poorly. The Norwegian government a few years ago um, actually made an official apology for the treatment of these Norwegian women and their um, uh, mixed uh, nationality children. I just have one more final question, um, which is, so um, from, the, uh, from the audience, historians like Yves Durand doubted that love or sexual relationships had a large share in quantitative terms. Would you revise this? Um, I didn't understand the beginning. Who doubted? Uh, so Yves Durand, historian yeah. Yves Durand. 
Yves Durand is basically writing works at the behest of veterans associations. And he didn't want to, I mean, he did speak about it. He has he deserves credit for that, but he didn't want to highlight the sexual nature or even the sincere nature of these relationships. Um, because for the prisoners afterwards, um, that is pretty much taboo. Um, it's hard enough to be a prisoner of war. Many prisoners have some sort of inferiority complex because they are in safety and captivity while their comrades are fighting and risking their lives. So many prisoners in retrospect, if they do admit relations, want to frame them sort of as a defiant act, as an act of resistance, as an act of, of, of almost of sexual conquest that um, they are performing. Um, so, and uh, that was the mentality um, in the 1980s when Yves Durand wrote um, his book. To his credit, he does uh, acknowledge this um, quite widely, but the prisoners themselves also usually try to, to, to downplay both the sexual and also the very sincere relational aspect of these relationships and try to interpret them as purely functional. Oh, this was a way to facilitate an escape, for example, or this was a way to secure additional food, of course, only for others, for my comrades, not for myself. So they can frame it as a patriotic, selfless act. Um, but th that's very, very far from the reality, the lived reality of these uh, couples. Brilliant. Well, that really was the last question that we've got time for. So um, I'm afraid I need to, to wrap things up now. It wouldn't be a book launch without an editor waving a copy of the book about. So I am pleased to be doing that now. Um, thank you, Raphael, for an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, really illuminating and just uh, just wonderful. And thank you, everybody, for those really interesting questions. I'm sorry if we didn't get time to get to yours, but um, it was a fascinating uh, conversation and I'm really grateful to you all for coming. Um, so Love Between Enemies is published now. Um, it's described by Nicholas Stargart on the back as a must read and I think Raphael has really explained uh, why that is the case and I hope you'll all agree. Um, thank you all very much for coming to this event um, and I wish you all very well with the rest of your days. Thank you Raphael. Thank you too and I want to say that it's been an absolute privilege working with you Liz and with your team at Cambridge University Press who really give academic publishing a very very good name you defy all the prejudices about um, big presses and um, it's been absolutely wonderful and supportive. Thank you so much. Well, it has been our privilege. That's a lovely note to end on. Thank you, Raphael. <laughs>